complete because I'm saved, saved, saved. Uh, what a great testimony this morning. And to hear the saints of God blend their voices together and uh, declare it loudly and in a, in a beautiful way. It's good to be in God's house on this Lord's Day, and it's sure good to be here with you. We're grateful for every individual, every family, who, whoever you may be that's come to be a part of our service today. You are just as welcome as you can be. And we mean it, and we, uh, we say it from our heart. We're glad you're here. Please make yourself at home and worship the Lord with us and then come back at, at your earliest opportunity. If you're visiting today for the first time, would you take a moment and take that long visitor's card from the pew in front of you and fill it out and uh, drop it in the offering plate when it passes as a token of our appreciation We'll uh, see that you get a copy of one of our choir's CDs. And uh, they've, it's, they've been a tremendous blessing to a lot of folks, and we'll, we'll see that you get one. And it sure is a joy to have you. Uh, Brother Mike Tipton is going to come and lead the choir, and they're going to lead us as we worship now in song. And we always invite everybody to sing along. Just, uh, you're welcome to make a joyful noise and do the Lord. Just uh, worship him today in spirit and truth. We're so glad that you're here, Brother Mike. Everybody doing okay today? Well, you, most of you look pretty good today. We're going to do something different today, and, and uh, Lowell and Cindy are going to come and sing a song, a very, very beautiful song, and you all know I badger Lowell all the time, and of course he never badgers me. <laughs> and uh, lightning's going to strike me. But... Uh, uh, the truth is, I badger Lowell about his singing, but Lowell's not the worst singer in the world. He's really not, and and uh, uh, he's really not. I mean, he can he can he can sing. Uh, do what? Uh, close to it, uh, and uh, he'd probably say that about me. But uh, they do. Uh, I remember first time I ever heard him sing this song. It's been. I don't know, 18, 19, 20 years ago when we were building this building here and we were meeting out in the fellowship hall and, and uh, they come and sung this song, says, Oh, what a friend is he. And uh, I remember just tore the house down that morning and uh, the Lord used them in a great way. And, and I've asked Lowell and Cindy if they would to, to come and sing this song for us this morning. So you be much in prayer for them. Yeah. 
to precious people. I don't know of any two people I have more respect for as Christians, as prayer warriors, as faithful uh, to the work of the Lord and the cause of Christ than I do these two. And I appreciate that. They touched my heart years ago, as Mike said, when I first heard them sing this song, when they first came to our church, but it's been, uh, it's been a lot of years ago now. But uh, they sing about a friend, and they are friends. And I love them so much. I appreciate them so much. I love you, Lord Buzzer. I just told Lowell, I love you, you old buzzard. Oh, goodness. Wonderful song. Wonderful song, and uh, we'll never have a friend like the Lord. Laid down his life. Yes, yes, sure is. And, uh, anybody got anything you want to say? I'm not trying to overstep my bounds here, Jerry. I just. Oh, we'll move on, man. And, uh, uh, how many of you have watched the news this week? Yeah, I've tried not to, as I told the first service this morning, and I didn't, I struggled yesterday trying to pick out my songs for today, and uh, uh, I was planning on continuing with the friend theme, and in light of what's happened this week, I just felt like I ought to go in a, in a, in a different direction, and uh, in light of, of these times, I think it best that, uh, that, the, that the songs today remind us of what to do when things like this happen. Uh, so we're going to do a couple of songs, and I told the, the first service this morning, I said I had to sit down and, and do something with my little boy this week that I didn't think I would ever have to do. But I had to sit down and tell him what he was going to be facing, what he was going to be seeing now. It's already on TV. And... Uh, and he'll be facing in the school, and so will your children and your grandchildren. And, uh, but I want to remind us as Christians uh, through song this morning what to do when things like this happen, okay? Pay particular attention to the words of these songs. Stand up for Jesus.
favorite song, pay again, pay particular attention to these words. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Time is filled with swift transition. with one another. Make our visitors feel welcome.
Think about that unseen hand and we rejoice that it's there. Uh, Moses would say underneath are the everlasting arms. And oh, Father, we're so grateful. Though we've not seen your hand visibly, we have felt your arms round about us, encouraging our very soul. And oh, Father, we're grateful that we serve a God who walks with us and talks with us and tells us that we are his very own. We understand, Lord, it gets a little more clear every day that we're just pilgrims and strangers in a foreign land. We're just passing through. This is not our permanent place of residence. And, Father, we understand that the world... A uh, system doesn't go along with your view of things and what your word declares, but Lord, uh, you're still in power. You're still on the throne. We're still your child, and you're coming again one day to receive us to yourself, and until then, our soul, our heart will go on singing. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit, of a loving God. Bless the tithes and offerings now of your people. Use this day to change hearts and lives forever. In Jesus' name I pray, and amen. amen.
For so many years I've sung when I've been happy And I've sung when I've had fears Some folks have even questioned If it's all been just a show But the reason that I'm singing I want the world to know I sing because there is an empty grave I sing because there is a power to say I sing because His grace is real to me I sing because I know I'm not alone I sing because someday I'm going home Where I shall sing through all eternity I've sung to those walking Through the fiery trial and I've watched their saddened faces Turn into happy smiles and i bowed my head and whispered Lord, please do the same for me and I'm glad that I can tell you He's always given victory I sing because there is an empty grave I sing because there is a power to say I sing because His grace is real to me I sing because I know I'm not alone I sing Someday I'm going home where I shall sing through all eternity. I sing because I know I'm not alone. I sing because someday I'm going home where I shall sing through all eternity. Dictate who I'm supposed to be. The world can't recognize all that I am inside, but I know in his eyes that I am a part of the bigger picture. There's so much more to me. He helps me see that I have so much to. It's rude. 
I will be inviting you to turn with me a little later on, uh, not right now. I'll be covering some passages that I want to share with you in a little while. But I'd like to speak to us, God willing, today on redefining settled truth. Redefining settled truth. On June the 26th, 2015, Five people on the Supreme Court put the moral decline of a nation on high-octane fuel and helped us to accelerate a once great nation's demise. If only one justice had voted differently, the outcome would have been different. The purpose for the vote of the Supreme Court and the ruling on this past Friday was simply to redefine marriage. By the way, this is a side note. The real power in America does not rest with who is president. The real power in America rests with who is appointed to the Supreme Court. They looked into the face of God and into the face of millions of God fearing people and said, we are in charge. This is our call to make and our will is now the law of the land. There's some, the term same-sex marriage is an oxymoron. It uh, is a joke. How can mere Mortal men redefine something that they didn't define to begin with. It was God who put Adam and Eve together. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 22. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her to the man. 
This is a divine act. God made woman, God made man, and God put them together. Look at the words of Jesus as found in Matthew chapter 19. I want to share those with us. Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 and 5. These are the words of our Lord. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Words of Jesus, by the way. And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. You can find The scripture that Jesus was quoting in Genesis chapter 2, verse 22 and 24 through 24. And then you'll find it quoted three more times in the New Testament verbatim. What marriage is has been defined by God and is settled truth. It has been settled truth for over, or maybe I should say close to, 6,000 years of recorded history. It has been settled truth. By the way, all truth is settled. And it's forever. And truth never changes. What do you suppose the ultimate purpose for this ruling might have been? I said a moment ago it was, first of all, to redefine marriage. But once that is done... There are several other things that will ripple like a wave out of Washington, D.C. and permeate this nation. It's very fiber. Here's what's hap going to happen. Here's some of the side effects of this redefining settled law. First of all, our population is going to become victim to 2 to 3% who live in America and they will be the bullies. They say, and they have said for many years, we just want to be accepted. We just don't want to be hated. We just want to coexist with everybody. And I'll tell you, uh, on the authority of being an observer of what's happened in our world, that's a lie. Because they're militant. A man and his wife who were devout Christians run a bakery. And when they were asked to bake a cake for a gay wedding, Ceremony they refused because they said it violated their personal convictions. So what did the gay couple do? They walked not down to another bakery. There were other bakers available. They didn't walk down to another bakery to get their cake baked. They went to their attorney's office and came back with a group of lawyers 
and the threats were so immense and the pressure was so intense that this couple just decided to close their business. They are militant. I know that not everyone is militant, but that's what you'll be seeing are the militants. You'll be seeing the militants. You, you'll see them wanting to punish people who have deep-seated, as I do and as you do, deep-seated, heartfelt conviction that, that, that it's wrong. They will seek to punish I believe with all of my heart that this is just one step in several steps that's aimed to destroy religious freedom. I believe they really want to silence God's people and God's church and religious freedom is going to be under assault like it's never been before. First thing that we may see happen, and Stephen could advise us on that more, but one of the first things you may see these trial cases across America where that some church refuses to let their building be used. Then they're engaged in a lawsuit. Some pastor refuses under... Uh, under his religious convictions to perform a ceremony and he is personally attacked, slandered, abused, and sued. And if you don't toe the government line, they'll take away our tax exempt status. I've got a statement about that and I want to make it clearly and I want everybody to understand, I think you do understand, I think you agree with me. Before we'll bend one iota, we'll pay taxes. They can have our tax-exempt status. We're not dependent on them giving us a tax-exempt status to, uh, to exist my dear precious friend, Jesus is the head of the church and he's in charge of the finances of the world. He'll take care of everything. The next thing that will happen, Christian schools will be forced to hire homosexual teachers. Of course, public schools have no choice. They, they will most definitely. But here's what's going to happen also. It's going to get into the curriculum. It will be forced into the curriculum. And little, little, little innocent children are going to be taught that this is an acceptable way of life. And this is perfectly normal. There's it's nothing abnormal about it. This is just a loving, kind thing to be good to everybody and go along with everybody and kowtow to everybody and bow down to everybody. That's, that, that's just what you have to do in life. That's what's going to, that's some of the things, repercussions that are going to come. But the Bible is clear. In Ephesians chapter 6, in verse 12, the Bible tells us who the real enemy is that we're facing. Listen to this. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's where the battle lines are drawn. Was it, were any of us truly shocked about what happened on Friday? I wasn't. You could have, many of us could have foreseen this coming 
a long time ago. By the way, I just well call a couple of names while I'm at it and stir the nest a little bit. I believe part of it started when, uh, when a Tennessee senator would say, I believe that, uh, President Obama ought to have who he wants on the Supreme Court, and so I'm going to vote for a homosexual representative to sit on the Supreme Court, and she's on there. We need politicians with no spine and no gut. That's where it started. I hear folks saying, well, I didn't vote. I had folks in our church tell me last election, I didn't vote, well, what's it matter? You're, you're looking at what, it, what matters about it. We're facing the consequences of why it matters why we ought to be engaged and involved in voting and have a voice and take a stand and be vocal. I'm not talking about being obnoxious. I'm not talking about being hateful and mean-spirited. I'm talking about having convictions that come from the word of Almighty God. We ought to have them. We ought to stand on them. I'm just now, that's my introduction. I'm just now getting down to my real message. How are Christians supposed to react? Supposed to behave? And supposed to feel in the light of all that's transpired? I don't pretend to be an expert on the subject. But I have diligently looked at the Word of God. And I believe there are about four things that I think the Bible would teach us. And I'm glad Mike led us in some of those areas in our music this morning. But I want to talk to us about some things that we can, re ways that we can respond in a Christian way. The first thing that I think we must understand is this. God is still on his throne. God is still on his throne. Look at Isaiah 46 and 9. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else, and I am God, and there is none like me. Malachi 3.6 would say, for I am God, and I change not. I change not. Not. God is still on his throne. Let's look at uh, uh, Philippians 2, uh, beginning in verse 9. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, talking about Jesus, and given him, Jesus, a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God is still in power. God is still on his throne, Hebrews 13, 8, the Bible says Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Guess what? The sun came up this morning. The, the birds were still singing and the grass was still green and the God of glory was still on his throne. He didn't have to have an emergency meeting of his heavenly staff to see what we're going to do about the Supreme Court ruling. God already knows what he's going to do. He's on his throne. The second thing, we are to love sinners the way Jesus did. I chose 
as a theme or a scripture for that is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. 1 John 3.16 would say, if God would so love the world, even so ought we to give our life for the world, for others. So we're to love sinners like Jesus loves sinners. Jesus looked down from the cross and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. We are to have the same mission on earth as Jesus had in Luke 19 and 10. The Bible says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor, all of you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you the rest that you're seeking for your soul. Our, our Lord clearly hates sin, but our Lord clearly loves sinners. Charles Spurgeon said it well. These are his words, I quote. If sinners be damned, let them at least leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped around their knees, imploring them to stay and let not one go unwarned or unprayed for. We are to love sinners like Jesus. Love sinners. I don't care what your sin is this morning. God still loves you. I don't care what you've done. God still loves you. I don't care where you are right now in your relationship to Christ. He still cares about you. But may, may I say something? It's very controversial among Christian people. And I know this because I've heard from some. Very controversial. I believe that loving sinners the way Jesus loves sinners includes telling them the truth and warning them of consequences. You say, what's it matter? What's it matter? Let people love who they want to love. Let people marry who they want to marry. What's it matter? It doesn't matter if you don't love their soul and if you don't care whether they go to heaven or hell and if you don't care about the consequences that's coming their way, it may not matter. But if you want to be like Jesus, if you love somebody, you're going to tell them the truth. Wimpy pastors standing all across America uh, doing book reports and everything else and uh, 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 saying, I, I, one told me one day I won't ever preach on hell. I tell you, I'd hate for my grandchildren to sit under that, uh, that pretender. If you love people, you'll tell them the truth. That's what Jesus did. You tell them the truth. Is it unloving to tell somebody they could go to hell if they fell except Jesus? Is it judgmental? No. It's factual. You're just telling them the truth. Con homosexuality also has consequences. And if I was talking today about my son or my daughter, or my grandbaby, I would pray to the Lord that somebody would love them enough to tell them about the consequences. What about HIV? What about full-blown AIDS?
on the news the other night. They were celebrating in D.C. and one homosexual guy was holding the picture of his dead lover where he was holding him in his arms who had, who had died of AIDS. That says it all. There's consequences. What about all the other awful uh, sexually transmitted diseases that, that the, the gay community is not the only one that has those, but they have a greater percentage than the rest of the population. The best authority is just to go to the word of God. Go with me to the book of Romans, chapter 1, beginning at verse 26. I want you to listen carefully to the word of God. This is not Baptist doctrine. This is not redneck doctrine. This wasn't invented in committee somewhere. This was not a, some little preacher that came up with this idea and went across the country proclaiming it. This is Bible doctrine. I want you to listen carefully these words with me for a moment. Romans chapter 1 beginning at verse 26, for this cause. Now here's the consequences of homosexuality. Here are the consequences. For this cause God gave them up. Now you're going you're gonna to see the cause he's talking about in a moment. God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, now here's the consequence. And receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. In other words, God just let you choose. God just let you love who you want to love and be with who you want to be with. You have that choice. But God is saying there's consequences. He turned them over to a reprobate mind. He's not through yet. To do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, Covenant breakers without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now, am I, am I, am I a hate monger? If I warn somebody I care about that your choices have consequences? Am I being hateful? Why can't we just all get along? Someone said. Another said we have no right to judge. And another said well what difference does it make? Listen, dear friend, what matters to God 
had better matter to his children. If it matters to God, it had better matter to you and I. That's what difference it makes. If I know there's a burning hell and won't tell a friend, do I really care? Or if I know what the Bible says about this sin and I do not share it, do I really care? Am I being judgmental to tell somebody what the supreme being of the universe said about something? I think no. It's time we got a backbone. It's time we nailed down. I preached on this last Wednesday night. I didn't know I was going to have to, but I, it's time we nailed down some convictions. The third thing that we are to do, we are never to compromise truth. Look with me at Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, yet put darkness for light and light for darkness, and put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe. Those are God's words. Across our nation today and yesterday and Friday night, there were massive celebrations about the Supreme Court decision. And by the way, they were at the White House too. Massive celebrations. May I ask you a question? When is it ever right to celebrate sin? Why don't we bring somebody here and celebrate the fact that they're an alcoholic? Why don't we celebrate that somebody is an adulterer? Just celebrate with them. Wear their colors. Get us some cute little sissified colors and put one and say we're celebrating the fact that this man is an alcoholic or an adulterer or a dope addict or a pedophile. We're celebrating their sin. It's wicked and it's ignorant, it's ignorant of Christians to help celebrate something that God says is wrong. I know how it is out in the marketplace, how it is at school. We want to be loved and we want to be liked. I'm the same kind of guy. I'm set by a drunk on the plane back, coming back from Brazil. The last thing I wanted him to do was ask me what I did for a living. <laughs> I wanted to tell him I worked at the A&P store. That's where I started in, down in the North City. But I, I, it's the last thing I wanted him to ask me. But he did. He was too far out of it for it to matter much. Why would we choose one sin to celebrate? You'd better be careful. Those cute little buttons and those cute little colors and those cute little emblems and those little pats on the back, everything's okay and I'm happy for you and I, I love you, I love you, I love you, I'd never condemn you, I don't, well, I'll never, never condemn you. You don't love that person. Get some... Get a backbone. We are never to compromise the truth. I will never perform a marriage that celebrates sin. I will never and I don't have to say it like this. This is a church. I know this church. This church will never 
turn over its facilities to anybody to celebrate sin in either. We cannot compromise. We're to love people like Jesus loved them. That, I don't mean we're to ever be bullies, ever to abuse, ever to berate, ever to just to push people down for the sake of pushing people down. I don't think that's the way Jesus ever done anything. But at the same time, we will never win them to Jesus as long as we're compromisers. Unless we're willing to be honest and share from the word of God what the truth is. Expect opposition. You're going to have it. By the way, Jesus promised me. Don't be surprised when you're put on the spot at work or put on the spot at school. It's going to happen. Jesus said, they that love me, they're going to suffer persecution. And then the Bible says we are blessed when we are persecuted for his name's sake. And then I close with the last thing. We are not to panic. We are not to get into panic mode. We are not to panic because God is in control and Jesus is coming soon. Let's go to Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians chapter one, verse seven. The Bible says this. And to you who are troubled, Rest with us. Might go ahead and get a song ready if you will. To those, to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Don't panic. He's still on the throne. He's still in charge. And he's coming back. How are you and I supposed to react tomorrow and the week after and today? There's two or three things that I'm going to say to Christians. First of all, we're to reflect. I believe there's a lot of spiritual reflection going on across America today. I believe there's a lot of people who used to come to church who are thinking about some things today that they haven't thought about in a while. Amen. But for you and I who are here this morning, we ought to reflect on where we are and whose we are, and upon any way that our lackadaisical way of serving Christ has contributed to the mess that we're in. And then thirdly, or secondly, we're, we're to repent. We're to repent. We're the week before God. I don't know about you, but I've had some times of weeping this week. I've had some times of weeping. We're to repent. And then we're to recover. And get busy winning people to Jesus. And I'm telling you, God's on his throne and the gospel still has the power to save.
It will still change lives if we'll proclaim it, if we'll preach it. Gospel still works. God's in charge. I want to take everybody to heaven that I can with me. I want to take those on Skid Row and those on Wall Street. I want to take those who are drunks and those who are dopers. I want to take those who are rich and those who are poor. I want to take those who are gays and those who are adulterers. And I want to take those who are thieves. And I want to take little boys and girls that have done nothing but steal a piece of bubble gum somewhere. Maybe, I don't know. I want to take them all to heaven with me. And see, the plan of salvation and the, the offer of the gospel has not changed one iota. It's still in place. I wonder if God would speak to hearts of this building today. Maybe some of us would want to come together and weep for America and weep for our children and weep for our grandbabies. Maybe some of us would just want to come and find a place somewhere on the altar and bow and say, God, give me the strength to be who I ought to be and what I must be. Give me the love for others that you had, but give me the boldness that I must have in this day when your name is defamed and drug through the mud. You can do what you want to. You always can. But I'm hoping that all over this building there will be some folks who find their way to an altar. Somebody has to weep. Somebody needs to weep over what's happening in this world. Somebody needs to be concerned about the children and the grandchildren. Somebody needs to ask God for grace and for gumption and for strength. Maybe some of us need to ask him for forgiveness. Oh, mm-hmm.
never been saved. If, if the Lord were to call right now, you're not ready to go, go to heaven. That would not be your final destination. There's only one alternative, and that's hell. This would be a great day, a wonderful day for somebody to say, I want to be saved. I want to make sure my name's in heaven. I want to make sure that I'm a child of God. I want to be born again. You can do it today. There may be others who want to, ought to come and unite with the church. However that God would direct you, you're welcome to follow his leadership. Let's sing another verse, Brother Mike, and you're welcome if you want to come. Just slip out from where you are. There will be people here to pray with you. You'll not have to pray alone, I promise you that. Would you just come while we sing? Time is not feeling the moments are passing. Passing from you and from me. Jesus.